I commit myself to explain you in 10 minutes all about SRAM compiler design. So I'm um, doubting a little bit the sanity of that decision, but I'm here anyway. So fasten your seatbelt, and I hope you enjoy the ride. Um, so I titled my talk, a portable area efficient SRAM compiler, a dot, dot, dot job somebody has to do. I leave it out. I leave it to you to fill out these dots after the presentation. So, okay. So this part is of a bigger project. Um, like a lot of open source EDA stuff, it's led by IHP and funded by the German government. And it's a, a thing about radiation hardened design where they do a radiation hardened PDK, uh, modeling of radiation effects on devices, radiation hardened digital cells, uh, continuous improvement infrastructure, and also SRAM compiler with and some radiation hardened extensions. So what is an SRAM? An SRAM is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's two back-coupled inverters. So you can put a zero and a one on each side of this back-coupled and it keeps that state. And then you have two uh, access transistors, also sometimes called pass gates, where you can open it and then you can either read the contents or write to it. And then you put this cell into an array and then you select a row and you look at a certain column and then you get your data. How simple is it? Huh? So the first thing is you have to design your SRAM cell. So this SRAM cell is symmetric. Um, I don't know if you know, but an inverter has two transistors. It has an NMOS and a PMOS and you have two access transistors. So you have six in total, but because it's a symmetric cell, you only have to design three and for three transistors. And for each of the transistor, you have to decide on the length and the W. So it's six parameters. So a pretty, a pretty easy job now. So what are the requirements for the SRAM cell? You want to have it static. So the difference between a static RAM and DRAM is that it's static. So you don't want to have a refresh. Also, you want to read the contents without destroying the contents. What you also do in DSRAM, when you read it, you have to refresh it. But you also want to have it write. You have to write data. And these two things, non-destructive read and write, or actually, you have to make a trade-off between these two. And then also, like everything in EDA, is power, performance, and area. And the most important thing I put here in bold is area, because that's the first thing what you want to do is your big caches on your design has to take as low area as possible. So how you do that? So the static, um, you do that by this six transistor design, or if you add two extra uh, pass gates and you have an eight transistor design for a dual port RAM. Um, so the other things you can do with simulations, I'm not going to detail, we can discuss that offline, uh, but the non-destructive read, you do that by a static notion margin simulation in the read state. Writability, you, you do that with simulation with the write three points. And then area. So uh, performance, you do that by looking at the read current. So what is the current that the SRAM provides? With that determines how fast it can load the capacitance and that determines the speed of your uh, SRAM compiler. And then for power on the cell, it's the, the, the static power consumption, so the leakage uh, consumption that you look at. And then area, there you either use special design rules, what I'm using for IHP, or you use a foundry provided cell that actually break all the DRC rules that you are so used to, obliged to, and then they are violating that themselves. Um, that's something that I will do later. I'm, so for the other open source technologies, I'm now using a DRC compliant. SRAM cell, which is not the most area efficient, but that's, I leave that for a further uh, project to look into that further. So uh, last year, I did the first step out with test structures. Um, I also did documentation, so not only the tape out, and it's on the IHP uh, tape out run. Um, I don't have wireless here, but I took a, a screenshot of the, the GitHub repository um, so that's a doc of the tape out, and you can see that I documented actually. Um, and this XP60 actually documents the, the, the simulations I talked before. So it gives you, it's a Python notebook where I did the simulation. So I, I provide 
you the possibility to do these simulations. Luckily for the current open source uh, project, the voltage is still high enough that you don't have to do much design. You just see if you use minimal transistors, they have enough margin, it's no problem. If you go to lower nodes with lower voltage, then these things become, and then also the variation, the variability between transistors becomes important. So, but that's again for when we have an open source 28 nanometer design. So after the SRAM design, you go then to design the block. Then what you have to do, you have to um, do the decoders, a row decoder, a column decoder, um, a pre-charge. So between each reach or write cycle, you pre-charge the bit lines to um, uh, a voltage, and then you start a new cycle, a clock generator. I'm not going to detail. Again, come to talk to me if you want to have the nitty details about this. But just one thing, for example, I used just a simple uh, CMOS SR set reset latch for my sense amplifier. Uh, if you talk to any analog designer, words his name, he will say, yeah, this is slow because you need a very big um, difference between your, you, I can make you a, a design that is much, least much more, less difference between the two bit lines and is much faster. But then it probably also has some requirements on turning it off and it gets more um, uh, requirements on the internal timing. So I preferred here to do the first design robustness over performance and then this improvement in speed can be done later. So that's general also for the row decoder design, uh, the column decoder design. I looked at, let's get it working and then improve later on. So then you have the clock generator. What it has to do is it has to avoid glitches on the output. So you only want to output your row decoder after the decoder has settled itself, because otherwise you get glitches on, on the word line and you don't want that, uh, that. And then you also want to be sure that you don't have pre-charge during your read or write cycle. So you do that with an overclapping clock circuit. If you have done the block design, then you go to the compiler design. And there comes the tedious part, because then you want to make a lot of variations on the block going for a very small block to a big, big SRAM block. And what you need to do there is you have to design your decoders uh, in such a way that they are area efficient. And I have now a test tape out, but what you can see here that for the smaller block, I still have uh, something sticking out because yeah, it was too much to really solve that before the tape out. I have some ideas on making for the small block the clone decoder can be made smaller and then I can move this down. But these are all the things that you have to do. So that's the easiest part of making an SRAM compiler. If you have done that, then you also have to ensure that the timing is correct for all your variations that you support. And for portability, I'm using my project Arakeen and PDK Master to make it easy portable beam technologies. I've presented that last year, so you can look up that video to look at more about that. Um, and then you also need to get, generate all the views that you need in your digital flow. Um, and one of the most important things is timing. Um, for big blocks, for example, this row, this word line, is a distributed RC delay. So even at a certain point, when it comes to a certain size, increasing the buffer here does not make um, it go faster at the end of the line because you get an RC filter actually on your line. So then you may have to think about other solutions. So I'm at the moment I'm finalizing my test chip design. I would have liked to say I finalized this to, to, to be in the thing of, uh, but I will finalize it this evening. And so I'd still at Orfcon to do the uh, finalization of the tape out. And plan is to have a beta release of the compiler end of this year for the three open source PDKs both single port and dual port SRAM. So then the radiation hardening, I have one minute left to do the radiation hardening. Uh, so then after December in um, April next year, there is a tape out plant and I will be looking and investigating of making my cell more bigger, so more resilient to single event effects, looking at also the buffering to make it more resilient to, to uh, single event effects, maybe use a single event um, hardened bit cell in the SRAM. Of course, it will be area, take more area. 
and then also flip-flops and latches. So this is my, you can contact me at my email address at Chipflow. I'm also following the SRAM uh, Fuzzy Chat channel. So it's something that Leo Moser started, I think. Um, and then I also have, for, for chip for makers, uh, for the PDK Master Runner Keen, I have my own channel. You can also post that if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, so how does this, uh, how the generated SRAMs, how do they compare to the existing SRAM macros on, for example, IHP? Is it twice as big or? only 10% bigger if you for, for the same number of bits? Uh, the area is a, of the, c the cell is a little bit smaller than their cell. So actually, I, I started from their design rules. I, I just took their design rules for the single SRAM cell, but I could find a little bit, squeeze out a little bit more area, which is similar in area. Ah, so, yeah. so, so it's actually better than... A little SRAM bit better, yes. Oh, nice. than, than what they, 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 their, their, their compiler huh? for oh. ISP, yeah. yeah. I'm not talking about commercial ones. I don't have access to them, so, yeah. First of all, thank you very much. I can't wait to try your SRAMs. Are you also planning to generate SRAMs with two separate bit cell arrays? What do you mean? Uh, like um, one bit cell array uh, on the right side and one bit cell array to the left side, like the SRAMs are currently done on IHP? That could be done, yes. Um, I think you save some area because you can share yeah. yeah, of course, it, 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 it halves the RC line of your word line, I agree, so it, it, it can be done. But of course, it, it makes the routing. So one of the, I also want to minimize the number of metal layers. So I only use up to metal three in my SRAM design so that you can use place, place a route routing above it. Um, maybe I cannot do that if you need to route this buffer output to the other side because I'm actually using metal three. So I have to find the route. Maybe I have to use metal four then to, to do that. But that's to be seen. But it can be done, I think, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, great work. Um, I was a little bit wondering on the decoder side, uh, the row decoder. Um, do you use hard mark or do you build macros for those ones? Because you can like share um, some of the gate uh, terminal transistor ports uh, for that one. Or I'm using just, just standard cells there, NANDs as okay. pre-decoders, and, and then an N3 for, uh, but that's custom designed to have the same height or as two SRAM rows. Okay. So I have a custom N3 as a last stage for area efficiency. A and on that one, uh, what about timing? Can you ensure that uh, your row decoder is really one hot and not creating shorts or anything or uh, on in your memory array? You know what I mean? Like if you go from one address to another, you may have data dependent latencies and it, there is sometimes a chance that you have multiple rows activated at the same time. No, no, so, so like I said, I generate a word line enable signal that's coming from the clock generator and that is only going high when I know that the oh. row decoder has settled. Oh. Yeah. Yes, okay, got it. Thank you very much, Staff. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Take it to the lunch break. <laughs>